Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's session, uh, both in person and online. Uh, we appreciate you being here today for the second of five sessions on the support service uh, initiative portion of the strategic transformation. I'm Chris Giordano, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. And today I'm joined by John Girdwood, Program Manager in the Office of Educational Opportunity Initiatives and Sociology Lecturer in CAS. So what I'd like to do to begin is get this to work. Check that out for me. I may have broken it too. Um, so this is what we'll cover today as we fix our clicker. Um, we'll frame today's conversation We'll uh, just review the process of how we've gotten to this point. Um, we'll uh, discuss what some of the resulting support initiatives were as part of the process. Um, then we'll speak very specifically about today's support initiative, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers. Are you able to, ex uh, to move on to the next slide? She'll have to do it here, okay. So just bear with us for one moment, please. Now it's working. Now it's working. Okay. I think you work on that slide. There we go. Uh, so for today, um, we're really providing an opportunity for um, an informational and listening session. Uh, provide the campus with an update about. Uh, the support services that are currently under consideration as part of the transformation. It's an opportunity to share uh, information at this point in the process and hear directly back from more members of our community. Today we'll focus um, you know, on support services uh, portion of the transformation and understanding that from the very beginning, this has been an iterative process. So we're sharing uh, information based on conditions at this time. Uh, keep in mind that we're at the proposal stage, so uh, we don't know what may or may not be supported um, in Ann Arbor or by the regents at this point. And currently, there are three uh, major initiatives happening simultaneously at the university. The strategic transformation, the campus master planning process, and the capital campaign. <clears throat> so there are obviously many overlaps and intersections among these three processes. And at some point there will be a mesh point where elements of all three will come together in support of each one and, and our broader institutional priorities. Um, so to uh, get started, essentially the phase two process of the transformation broadly focused on enhancing student success, student life operations and infrastructure that will pro positively impact RRG. Uh, so because this has been an extended process and we've been involved in this for quite some time, uh, at each of the sessions, we're just going to very briefly go over what the process was that got us to this point to give folks um, either a refresher or to make sure that they understand um, how we've arrived at, at where we are today. <clears throat> so all of the information was either captured or generated during part one of the process, which was the focus on the academic portfolio of the institution. And on this chart, it's referred to as metadata. Metadata consists of the market demand analysis, course economics review, community engagement and stakeholder feedback, and the holistic synthesis of findings in the form of a synthesis report. Stakeholder feedback includes information received through surveys, focus groups, interviews, emails, the strategic transformation website feedback form, chancellor's open office hours or by appointment, but in all, 
about 2,000 pieces of feedback were collected and compiled into a data sheet. So all of this information was shared with for working groups, academic deans, ITAC, staff, and student government. Using this data as a starting point, each of these groups was charged with submitting recommendations for consideration in the form of proposals. And each group was able to submit up to 10 proposals based on proposal guidelines. So proposals were submitted to project leadership for review and evaluation based on established guidelines and evaluation criteria, <clears throat> while project pri prioritization criteria were established in review of each proposal, evaluation of proposals was reviewed through an RRG lens with recruitment, retention, and graduation acting as the key filter. The strongest proposals were evidence-based and supported through data research, literature, national standards, and or, and, and or best and high impact practices. So proposals were prioritized and incorporated into 10 project areas. So these are the 10 project areas that emerged. The six on the left column will be discussed through our sessions. And today in particular, we're discussing uh, the second bulleted item pathways. So here are the six support initiatives plotted sequentially into a modified Gantt chart. We wanted to provide a visual rep representation of the primary periods of intervention and impact of each initiative and demonstrate how they align along a progressive pathway throughout the student life cycle. While each of the impact, while each will impact students differently throughout the student life cycle, we feel that the highlighted areas represent the periods of highest impact. So this is represented through a four year undergraduate model for the purposes of this presentation. So we understand that navigating the student experience is most times not linear, but it does demonstrate how support initiatives extend from pre-enrollment through graduation, regardless of major or program, are complementary, complementary in nature through the student life cycle, designed to serve all students taking into consideration subpopulations, cohorts, and course modality. And these will be discussed in more detail in each of the sessions. And it prioritizes health and wellness as a foundation for student success and well being. And this certainly applies to online students, graduate students, professional program students, each of whom have a different set of needs. So, with that background in place, I'd like to ask John to come up and present on the Pathways Initiative. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's really great to be here. It's really great to be here. I have to admit, I wrote a lot of jokes for um, with students in mind, and I'm not going to use any of those because I don't see any students in the room. But I had a ton of great jokes for students. Um, and usually I present to students because I'm a lecturer in sociology. And uh, I want to be clear that these slides are not a lecture. They're not intended to be a lecture. Um, Chris made me delete about 50 slides that would have bored you greatly. Um, but then I was like, yeah, what's the purpose of this? It's not a lecture. Um, it's to provide information about the transformation. So I'm an adjunct lecturer in sociology, and I've been teaching sociology for more than 10 years, and I've lived in Flint for over 20 years. And I also manage a program in educational opportunity initiatives, which is the office um, that does a lot of pathways work. Uh, I wanted to point out that some of this information and ideas are not necessarily brand new. Um, we've had pathways type programs at U of M Flint, at least dating back formally to 1967, um, formerly known as a challenge program. And Alvin D. Loving, who founded this university with other faculty, was uh, embedded in the community and in our local schools. He was an educator and dean of education here in, in Ann Arbor. Also want to point out that the discussion around comprehensive studies is also not new. Um, Ann Arbor has had comprehensive studies since 1983 in the College of Liter Literature, Science, and the Arts. 
In January of this year, Steven Zwanmacher, a philosophy professor, had a, a, a discussion about comprehensive studies in French Hall with a bunch of faculty and staff members. And uh, last month uh, at the Board of Regents meeting, if you attended that, there was a public comment from Noah Bedoun um, about comprehensive studies, and it was looked upon favorably by Mark Bernstein, one of our regents. Um, so that is to say that all this stuff is has has been discussed this year at various places by various people and dates back decades. We're just trying to um, kind of refresh it and bring it back in, in a more vibrant, robust, comprehensive um, and structured way. So here's our point of uh, entry into this discussion, um, our reason for action. So if you look at the mission statement for U of M Flint, you see pretty clearly that we're a comprehensive urban university focusing on local teaching, learning, and student-centeredness, among other things. But you can't really start a project unless you are you know, focused on the mission. So I really wanted to highlight comprehensive urban university for this presentation. And these were several, several of the slides that uh, I cut out was, because um, I'm a sociologist, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk all about what urban was and this and that. So, but I wrote down in my notes, if you want to know what urban is, ask Jacob Letterman, uh, urban sociologist at U of M Flint. Don't take it from me. Um, but one of the things, and I watched Julie's presentation last week, and Julie had a bunch of uh, academic citations. So one of the things I did over the weekend and last week was dug into the literature. And I'll be brief by saying that urban education is centrally defined by educational inequality. That's one of the things in the literature. Uh, so I wanted to focus not only on what an urban university is, but what we do, and that is advance our local community through education. We're an educational institution. You know, we're not a religious institution or this or that. So how can we advance our local community through education? We're a comprehensive urban university and that's our job. Uh, I use uh, this slide to point out too that uh, although I'm an adjunct, adjunct lecturer, uh, I work in student affairs primarily and my side of the transformation, our group, our subgroup was focused on this question and this part of the transformation, but nowhere in these slides would we talk about like what academic majors or programs are gonna be part of the transformation. That's on the other side, the other subgroup with the deans and all of them. So it's a really important distinction that our, the work we're doing here and on these slides is an overlay for what will be coming out of that other subgroup, okay? So this is our part and they're working on their part and we're working together, um, but that's why some of this stuff will be talked about here. And some of the stuff will be talked about by that group. Okay, I snuck in my sociology slide, uh, and that is um, some regional context, some demographic information about Genesee County. Um, our pathways proposal is really focused on to start six select schools. Uh, so we have five of those schools very nearby to our campus, and we can start with Beecher High School. And we identify Beecher High School first because it's an existing gear up school. It's an existing partner that we're already in with our programming, but also has a 97% rate of students who participate in free or reduced lunch programs. That's very high. Um, we kind of set our bar at 75% for the schools that we wanted to look at. You see, Michael Hamity has 90% participation in free or reduced lunch programs. Uh, Southwestern Classical Academy, 94%. Mott Middle College, which is on the campus of um, Mott Community College, 85%. And Carmen Ainsworth High School, which is the district that I live in, 76% of free or reduced lunch programs. We also identified Genesee Early College because it sits on our campus. It's right here in French Hall. And we know that there are other schools like Kersley, Grand Blanc, Flushing, Davison, Bendel, and Bentley that we could get into, especially with the current state of like school of choice. So uh, students who may live in Flint or in an urban community and um, participate in high school and education outside 
of where they lived. Um, we'll look at those schools probably next, but we could only focus on six for the first kind of go around. Also uh, put some statistics on this slide about the um, percentage of adults in these communities who hold bachelor's degrees. And this is another reason why we wanna get into those communities because our job as an educational institution is to provide some up, upward mobility for the communities that surround us. And if you look at Beecher, 5.6% uh, of adults 25 or older hold bachelor's degrees. And you can look at Flint, the city, it's 12%. 19% in Flint Township. And 9.8% in Mount Morris. And then I show some other um, geographic locations there for comparison. But it, it's really important that if we're going to go into schools where there is economic disadvantage, as indicated by the rates of free or reduced lunch program, we also look at the academic disadvantage. So these are the criteria um, that helped us select these six schools to start a pathways program through this proposal. At U of M Flint, you know we have over 4,000 students undergrad, and only about 6.9% of those are from the select six high schools that I mentioned on the previous slide. If you want any more detailed information, you can contact Institutional Analysis. They're great folks, and they can provide you some data. 38 students of our undergrad population are from those select high schools I mentioned on the last slide and participate in the programs that we um, manage in the Office of Educational Opportunity Initiatives. And there are some interesting statistics about those 38 students. 29% of those 38 students um, had a high school GPA under 2.7. 39% of those students placed into English 100. And 42% of those students placed into Math 105. Yet their average college GPA at U of M Flint is higher than standard admit students or higher than the general student body. It's a 2.86 GPA currently for those students who came in placing into Math 105 and English 100 and with high school GPAs under 2.70. It's kind of fascinating, really. Um, but we have programming in place and a model that really supports those students towards success. So I looked at like how many of uh, those students are in person versus all online. And more of those students are in person, okay? And that's, that's important to note um, because a lot of our support is like hands-on, like in our office, face-to-face. -face. Students are coming in on Fridays and we're tutoring them in math, like just one-on-one. -on -one. It's really cool to see. So that's why I think that's important. But again, we'll overlay like our stuff onto what academic affairs um, side of the house comes up with. So if there's a lot of, on, that's one area we have to get better at in our office is supporting students who are participating in only online classes. That I acknowledge, we have to get better at that. Uh, like I said, 10% more likely to place into math or English um, and uh, two times more likely to finish high school with that GPA under 2.70, but higher GPA. Okay, I got more notes, but I'm gonna move on and show you our like target goals. So um, what was it? 287 students currently from those select high schools by 2030, which is six years, um, six academic years. Uh, we wanna have a 50% increase in the number of students coming from those high schools. That's the addition of you know, 20 every year. Um, and we wanna kind of cut in half the, the numbers or the rates placing into Math 105 and English 100. And we could do that because our Pathways program, our proposal for Pathways program, and our existing Pathways program called Gear Up here at U of M Flint engages these students in seventh grade. And so, you know, the, the ultimate testing into Math 105 probably started at before seventh grade. But if we can intervene in seventh grade and, and support these students, um, through tutoring, mentoring, and, and college prep programming from 7th through 12th grade, we theorize that we could reduce the um, rates of those placing into math 105 and English 100. And of course, we want to sustain that high GPA. 
And so we're going to do that through wraparound supports, collaborations with faculty. And, you know, one of the reasons that GPA is so high on average is because those classes that I mentioned, Math 105 and English 100, are like comprehensive classes. So the faculty was selected uh, by Cam McLeeman um, in partnership with our office uh, for math. And I heard the most amazing thing last week when I was um, coaching a student who had some financial aid struggles. So that was the reason they were in my office. But I was like, well, what, what classes are you taking right now? And they told me. And one of those classes was, was math 105. And I was like, okay, how do you like that? And I kid you not, the student says to me, math is my favorite class right now. My math professor is my favorite professor that I have. And it's the class that I'm doing the best in. And I was like, are you kidding me? Because last year, our like uh, drop fail withdrawal rates from math were like 50% or something like that. And all of our students dreaded taking math. And so the work we've done in the last year to work with CAM in the math department and the math faculty has really changed the game because like our program is involved with the math, math faculty. We do this extra tutoring and we've really just kind of turned, turned the tide on how students are experiencing math here at U of M Flint. And I think one of those ways you have to talk to Cam for the details, but Cam has selected professors to teach these classes that are like high school teachers or have experience teaching high school. And so it seems to be working when you get that kind of vibe into these classrooms and with these students. And of course, Stephanie Gelderloos teaches uh, English 100 and is really crushing it. And so I see Stephanie out in the community and at Luna events, and we talk and we support our students collaboratively and collectively and comprehensively. And that's why these outcomes come out like this. So we know it's working. We just got to figure out how to scale it, how to replicate it, and how to uh, keep improving uh, on the things that we can improve on. All right, moving along to our solution approach. Okay, so we talked about our reason for action and our current state and our target state and some of the gaps. How are we gonna accomplish our goals? Well, like I said at the beginning, some of these ideas aren't brand new. We're just going to leverage some of the old ideas and some of the currently existing programs um, uh, and the knowledge that's out there uh, so that we can make good things happen here at U of M Flint. There's a comprehensive studies program in Ann Arbor. Uh, there are pathways programs that currently exist here at U of M Flint, one called Gear Up. And we just added a grant um, to facilitate a transitions program at Mott Community College and with Muskegon Community College as a partner. And this, again, is to focus on the student's longitudinal journey. And so if we engage a student, say, through pathways in seventh grade, and that student attends, say, Beecher High School, and they want to go to college, but they choose Mott Community College, we have a program in place for pre-college, and we have a program in place to support them into Mott and from Mott to U of M Flint if that's their journey. And so it's this really longitudinal approach, um, collaborative approach, partnerships with the schools, both the community college and the high school, um, so that we can build social and academic skills and support for the scholars who do these um, academic journeys like this. And then once they get here to U of M Flint, we want to have a nice landing spot for them. Uh, we want to build out a formal comprehensive studies program. At least that's the proposal. I think we've been doing comprehensive studies here at U of M Flint informally for many years, like uh, the Promise Scholar Program. Uh, it was a lear learning and living community. Um, it had select faculty and select classes. It had it has stipends and, and all this stuff. So Promise Scholar Program and King Chavez Park Scholars is, I think, comprehensive. I teach sociology to 25 Promise Scholars this semester. So that's like what the Comprehensive Studies Program does in Ann Arbor. They have select faculty that work in the program, that teach the students. I'm doing it right now. It's just not called Comprehensive Studies. So we're going to build from the framework we already have here, the existing program that's been known as Promise Scholars for a while. And we're going to work with our Ann Arbor partners. They've got a great model down there. 
we're going to probably, you know, we're going to propose their model, which is the select faculty model, the cohort classes, the wraparound supports like test prep and tutoring, coaching and mentoring, which I said we already do here. It's just not formally called comprehensive studies or anything like that. We're going to build strong partnerships with TCLT. I myself have a great partnership with them. I just attended a conference last week funded by TCLT. Thank you. Thank you, TCLT, for that. Um, strong partnerships with academic affairs, uh, which we already have, just keep strengthening them throughout um, our programming and faculty, and really embedding this into the culture and fabric of U of M Flint. I always say, like, our program with that supports students who encounter academic and economic barriers is not a niche program. Um, if you just look at our entire student population, that is our university, or at least at least half, if not more. Um, so it's really, I think, about embedding this type of approach into the entire university instead of just one office, one place that some people know about and some don't. I also want to point out that mm, we're doing this or we're proposing to do this through a very cost effective manner. And I think that's important to note how we're going about that. For example, last two years, we had a summer bridge. It was great, very successful. We paid for that whole entire thing basically out of our operating budget. We paid tuition, we paid housing, we paid meals and all this stuff out of our operating budget. Well, I looked at Ann Arbor's comprehensive studies program summer bridge model it's like the twin or the cousin of our pro we, we do like the same stuff but i was like well how do they pay for theirs well one way is if you have the students fill out the fafsa before they get to the summer bridge their financial aid can actually kick in so if they have the go blue guarantee if they have the michigan achievement scholarship if they have pell grants if they have any of that support it could have actually paid for the functions of the summer bridge. And we just weren't operating like that until we started looking at our partner's model in Ann Arbor and talking to financial aid. I was talking to Lori and um, Mary about it. And it's like, sure, we could still have the same program. There's other ways to get funding. Uh, and that's one way. Another thing is we, uh, within the this calendar year, we got a grant of $500,000 from the Mott Foundation. And we got three new six-year grants for $1.2 million, $1 million from the state of Michigan. So if we keep getting external dollars and we keep looking at cost-effective models, like Ann Arbor actually has, believe it or not, I can't believe it, I'm saying this, Ann Arbor had a more cost-effective model than we did here at U of M Flint. Oh my goodness. Um, I can't believe it. that's actually true. And so if we adopt their model, it would be more cost-effective and we could keep getting the same outcomes that we've been getting uh, here at U of M Flint through the Promise Scholar and the King Chavez Parks program. So with that, you know, thanks. And we'll open it up for questions and answers. Thank you, sir. So before we move on to Q&A, John, don't sit down yet. Come here. And I want you to turn around. And I want you to look at John's shoes. So John has UMF branded shoes. And it does one say KCP and one says KCP for King Chavez Parks. He's living it. He's living it. All right, guys. So this, this is your time. This is Q&A, um, online, in-person, um, comments, questions, remarks, whatever you guys would like to talk about. And we have we have two mics, but thank you. Um, I like the approach that you presented, John. I'm wondering if there's any way that current students who have either graduated from these six high schools and maybe look like the students and can help influence the students, what ways they can be um, embedded into this approach. Um, I know it it makes a good impact or a large impact when, like I said, students can identify, they see someone that they may have known or went to school with. So in what ways can we engage our current students who have graduated from these high schools to help um, make the transition a little easier for incoming students? 
great. Thank you. Um, just quickly, and then I'll turn it over to John. I think one of the ways is the power of peer mentorship, and that's something that we're embedding within our culture here. But again, it's a question of scale. How do we scale this? So all students can, can benefit from this kind of relationship, both on the way in and when they're here, that they can then share their knowledge and experiences in ways that support other students. But John can give you a more specific answer. That's a great question. And um, it makes me think and thank the Mott Foundation for the grant that they gave us because we had stipends that we could recruit uh, students with for, for freshmen and sophomores. The Mott Foundation gave us uh, the grant to provide stipends to upperclassmen, juniors and seniors. So the first thing we did was look for students from those high schools to give stipends to, which is a great recruitment tool to get students into the program. So we drew a whole bunch of students from those high schools into our program as juniors and seniors, because that was specifically what the Mott Foundation wanted us to do with those funds was those completion years of uh, junior and senior. And another thing we did to go off of uh, Chris's mentoring um, point was we identified because because we had a limited number of stipends, so we couldn't like just go full scale with this. But we identified like the real um, priority prioritization or the real issue, the real gap in our program. The first thing I noticed in our program was we weren't graduating nursing students from our program. And I reached out to Dean Cynthia and I was like, we got to do something. And so um, one of the things we did with the stipends was recruit students into our program from those schools and especially nursing upperclassmen. And so now we had like 12 underclassmen pre-nursing majors, many from those high schools who are just falling off so quick and just struggling so much. Now we have an equal number, just about equal number of upperclassmen, student, nursing students who are in the nursing program. So now these junior or sorry, freshmen and sophomores can work directly with the juniors and seniors, both on classwork, academic work, but also kind of sharing their struggles and seeing that it is possible that they can do it. Now, the next step we have to do is get into the schools. So have those nursing or pre-nursing students get into the high schools and be like, I'm doing it at U of M Flint. You could do it too. Um, a partner, a colleague of mine reached out to me recently from the Big Brothers Big Sisters. So I'm going to try to uh, develop a mentorship program with Big Brothers Big Sisters. They're like begging me for students um, to get into that program. And so that we could start this whole process, like I was saying, from seventh grade all the way up through graduation. And then probably the next stage would be then engaging more alumni from those schools who graduated from U of M Flint to come back and mentor the upperclassmen who mentor the underclassmen who mentor the younger kids, hopefully we build that whole, whole thing through this, through this program. Yeah. Um, Stephanie Gilkey asks, are there any plans to have linkages with UM Flint graduate programs? Through the pathways program or just in general? Sure. Yes. Um, so uh, we understand that much of our growth will be occurring in the graduate um, in graduate programs in the graduate sphere. It's it's occurring um, with professional program students, and it's certainly occurring with um, our online students. And as John referenced, I mean, online is something that's relatively new for us. So whether it's graduate or undergraduate, we have to figure out how we can do this more effectively. I think we have to get a little bit more organized and strategic about how we're interacting with our online students and um, ensure that we have a way to measure their experience to determine if it's working or if there are some things that we need to do differently. But certainly for graduate students, one of the um, largest areas that we see need in is for um, is around student health and wellness. So um, we have developed a very comprehensive model for, for uh, student health and wellness on this campus, which was very different from when I first started here. Um, so we have um, increased our capacity um, probably, you know, five-fold from what we were able to do initially, and that's been done through increased staffing, 
It's been done through strategic partnerships with Ann Arbor, through telehealth, psych services, and student legal services. And it's done through some additional um, partnerships and outreach on this campus. Um, at one time, we were really only able to provide direct service to students because that is all uh, the capacity that we had. But as we continue to build capacity, and what, one of the things we wanna do is um, tap into the Okanagan Charter um, status that we have at the University of Michigan, and we want to continue to move toward becoming a health promoting campus. And I think that will help with all students, but, you know, certainly for graduate students. And that's an area that I think they need additional support. Another area is around um, career services. Um, our graduate students need some additional help when it comes to career preparation, when it comes to being able to um, reach out to alumni and conduct informational interviews, whether it's job shadowing. Um, many of our students are already in clinicals, but they also need some additional help around uh, employment services too, when they're about um, ready to graduate and move on. Um, many of our international students need this as well. So that's an area that needs to be more robust. It's an area that needs more investment. It's an area that needs more growth. Um, and I think that's something that that we're working toward as well. Um, the other thing that I'll say is many of our graduate programs are very, they're cohorted and, and the, the programs have very specific needs. So I think another part of this process is to identify a little bit more clearly with the deans, with the program directors, with the faculty, what are the needs that are emerging that we currently either aren't meeting or we can um, support more, uh, more effectively and, and try to provide some more targeted services to students based on what, what their particular needs are in those graduate programs. But I would say those are some of the areas that we're thinking about in terms of supporting grad students. I had my own question, but I'll follow up on Stephanie's comment first, because I think where she most likely was coming from is that in the health sciences, at least, they're very, um, very interested in increasing minority representation in the class. And you need to reach out to them on the student services side to engage them, because I, th I think you'll find a very willing partner among the health science and and just like you did with nursing um, to work with. And so I'll, I'll just leave that there. Um, and then my question is for you, uh, well, both of you maybe, I don't know. Um, it, I know that some of our students struggle when they their Pell Grants run out. And so by using, um, having them fill out the FAFSA early, which is gonna happen anyways, right? Because of changes that the legislation just did. Um, so with those changes and using that, are we then endangering those same students from running out of money on the tail end of their degree? And I, I just, I wanna be aware <laughs> if there are issues that would arise later. I, you know, I don't know that I have a, a specific response. I'm not sure if John does, but certainly one of the things that has emerged as part of this process was a need for us to um, really evaluate what our student financial support strategy is and how we package students and then um, how we can expand that to not necessarily focus in on the traditional FIDIAC students, which I think historically is, is our philosophy around that, but to really evaluate our philosophy and then determine how do we meet the needs of a variety of students and build that and embed that into our, um, our strategy and philosophy for how we package our students. Um, I, I know that we also have things like completion grants and I think that also needs additional evaluation because many of these completion grants go unused. So we know the need is out there and we have some resources, but there seems to be a gap in there somewhere. So I think there needs to be a, another level of analysis when it comes to um, what our current student financial assistance strategy is and then where the gaps are and then how we can kind of fill those gaps.
Go ahead. You can get her next. Okay. Um, so it sounds like the main like student focused population are students from like economically disadvantaged areas. And I'm just wondering how students with disabilities um, who access the general education curriculum and um, can get into the University of Michigan Flint, how they could also access these pathways, because I think some of the supports, and I know, John, you and I have talked about this at length, but I know a lot of the supports offered would be really beneficial for students with disabilities as well, students with learning disabilities, ADHD, students with autism. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just quickly comment and then hand it over to John. One of, so three um, areas in particular emerged as part of this, this initiative. One was uh, an example of how we can further expand our support was Wolverine, Wolverine Pathways in Ann Arbor. That was one example. Comprehensive Studies Program, that was another example. And then we were thinking about a uh, neurodivergent learners or scholars program. And that's something that needs more attention. It's not getting the level of attention that it really needs. And I think that also speaks to how we need to expand our disability services area. And that needs to be um, more robust in what we can offer students, but I'll give it to John. Yeah, that's a great question and a great point. Um, and it makes me think the harder program for me to think of how to do that would be pathways. Um, and the, the, what you might call easier um, of the two to implement something like that would be with comprehensive studies, because it makes me think about the students who have come into the program that I currently manage based on their high school GPA. And then it turns out a significantly high percentage of those um, receive services from a disability and accessibility support services. And so even though we weren't going out and recruiting students based on any type of ability criteria, they landed in our program. And so I think that a comprehensive studies program could facilitate support for students that fall into that category. I always make a, a reference when I'm in my office talking to a student, I knock on the wall and I go, disability support services is literally on the other side of this wall. It's right there. It's right through this wall. And so uh, we have a good relationship with them right now, but um, I think I I do I just think comprehensive studies program is one way that we could support those students, and I think it comes down to a mechanism of finding those students and engaging them in the programming, um, because it's easy for me to see where a, a student graduated from high school, but it has taken me sometimes days and weeks, but sometimes months, if not years. Um, to get a student uh, to divulge to me that they're working with DAS or that they have, uh, um, uh, that they're neurodivergent. So I think that's the, that's the program we could start to build out. If you have any ideas on how to do it through pathways, they'll let me know. Cause I'm blanking on that. You know, I don't know how we could do that other, other than finding students with IEPs, 504s or something in high school and working on an individual pathway um, with uh, those, those students. But I, I can't think of anything else. So it's a good, good question. Thank you. Uh, this is a comment from Lori Vetter. She says, thank you, John. Your presentation aligns very nicely with the work of the retention committee over the past year. As you know, the math and English cohorting has been piloted this fall and it may work to cohort more gen ed courses. Additionally, the high schools you listed are all partners with our direct admit pathway program for fall 24 admissions. Early admission numbers look promising from those districts, and I can see a direct relationship with your proposal. Thank you. that makes sense for our students and uh and and meet their needs but also fit in with the type of institution we are and um you know with within some some of our limitations that that we currently have so um that's how we're approaching it
Uh, thank you for the presentation, John. It's good to see you in person uh, this time. Um, so uh, I just want to say as you're crafting those um, that we know the the importance of writing for students and that I hope that you consider the writing center uh, as a partner for some of these pieces. Um, I think that that we can play a role in that. A recent study showed that it increased retention of our students, uh, those students who use the writing center. Um, and interestingly, we're starting some work, we're doing some research on neurodiversity. Um, so we've already implemented some pieces into the writing center to try and accommodate our neurodiverse students, um, but we're doing a deeper dive on that as well. Yeah, no, that's great. And and I think that's something that um, just in, in my um, observation and experience being here for five years, um, we could certainly do a better job of collaborations, working across boundaries. Um, it doesn't, we don't have to be in the same division in order for us to work together. And I think we could just be much more efficient and effective with the way that we provide services to our students and 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 in a way that probably better meets our financial model with the way that we provide services to our students so i think um the environment is ripe for these kinds of either um enhanced partnerships new de newly developed partnerships um cross collaborations um and certainly a multidisciplinary approach is probably going to uh, yield the best results so i i think that that's one of the exciting things about this for me is i think we really have an opportunity here uh to reimagine how we do a lot of things and it's not necessarily to say that the way we're doing it uh isn't working or it's wrong but perhaps we could do it differently and better. And, um, you know, we have to continue to evolve and grow as, as our students and, and the higher ed landscape continues to evolve and grow. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to do things just like that. I, I, well, I still, while I still have the mic, I'm also going to throw out there that um, we see a number of students. So speaking about the undergraduate to graduate programs. And so we see a number of students that that, that leap is very challenging for them. Uh, and so we would be very interested in thinking about some pathways. We're already thinking about some programming at that level to think about helping undergraduates transition to graduate programs. Uh, but we'd be very interested in, in looking at some, some uh, more comprehensive options to, to support our students. Thanks for, thanks for that. Um, thanks for that. And it, so oh, I have so many thoughts and that's why I had to cut 50 slides out of that presentation. Um, but it makes me think a couple of things. Number one, there is a pathway all the way to graduate studies here at U of M Flint. A lot of people don't know about it. It's called Future Faculty Fellowship. We have a grad student in our office who's in the Doctorate of Education program who came up through all these programs, landed into that grad program, and now gets a full tuition scholarship um, through that program. It's called Future, Future Faculty Fellowship. So this is a, a, a journey where a student could start with us in seventh grade and all the way become a faculty member through us. Um, so if we could work on the future faculty fellowship with you, that'd be awesome. But the reason why I leapt up here uh, when you started was because the, so much of this stuff is in our heads. And like I said at the beginning, I know some of these aren't brand new ideas. Let me give you an example that you already know about. I sent an article that Bob Barnett published 10 years ago or 12 years ago to my colleague, Diamond Wilder, who does the, the pre-college programs about those writing workshops in the schools. He got a grant, he put writing workshops through the writing center in the local schools. And that was awesome. And that happened like 12 years. We just need to do that again. Let's bring it back. You know, that's one thing that we could do. So thanks because we're thinking about that and I want to do that so bad. Yeah, for sure. So the word grants has come up several times. And, and John, I know you just, wrote one and and I have been talking uh, with David Luke about the possibility of a trio grant uh, submission. And so my question for you, it takes time to write a grant and, and a lot of effort goes into that. So what can we do to better enable that? Um, because yeah, I, I know we need help in that area. And, and uh, just one thing, I, I'll let you know that the EOI office is 
practically entirely funded through external grants. It's not the preferred method of funding this, but it's out of necessity that we're funding it that way. My budget in the Division of Student Affairs, half of my budget is funded through external funding. So this is a constant priority for us to identify external sources of funds and to kind of go after go after that money. But to Interim Chancellor Fry's question, it is time consuming. And if that's not your exclusive focus, like it is an EOI, because we just went after and got 1.2 million for three six-year grants, then it's difficult to kind of build that into your, to your work day and your structure. But I think John has ideas. Yeah. So, cause I'm a sociologist, I'll say step one, we need to embed it into our culture. It needs to be part of the norms, beliefs and values of our institution and our community of faculty. Um, but I can also say that I was just, what's today, Monday on Friday, working with Jen Alvey and um, Emily on grant stuff. So we were doing a workshop shop on grants on Friday. It is part of our culture. We just need to grow it. But specifically to your question, I learned all my grant writing skills when I worked in Ann Arbor through Mishar. I would go to a workshop from Mishar like every week. That's Michigan. I think it's clinical health research. And so um, if we have a lot of individuals at this university that want to write grants, I think our uh, partner friends in Ann Arbor, like Mishar, uh, we could just uh, invite ourselves to their workshops because that's where I learned how to do it all. So, yeah, that would be a great. And go to those workshops. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, that stuff's right there, right there. I would say the other thing about um, grant um, I, uh, grant identification, you know, grant writing, grant acquisition, you know, that that's firmly been in the academic realm forever. And I think for folks that don't have that background and don't do that as part of their daily routine, you know, it's it's difficult and I think it's intimidating, but it's something that I know in our division, we, we have um, invested in to say, you know, we need to be able to do this and continue to do it. Um, so I think in addition to the Ann Arbor resources, I think a little, shift in mindset toward it's not just a faculty um, activity, because I think sometimes in ORED, you know, that's where the exclusive focus is. I mean, we have, I think we have about seven grants in, in EOI. So um, I think some additional um, organization around how do we provide this across campus, I think would be helpful for those that are not in academic areas. Oh, I'll see. I'll this is just a quick comment and appreciate Jacob speaking up since just so it's on record too. libraries too, we're definitely willing partners. Something we've been doing in the last year and a half since I've been here is reorganizing first our librarians so that rather than a librarian for English, a librarian for math, they're focusing on our student population. So someone who focuses, focuses on instruction and outreach, someone who focuses on research and scholarship. I love hearing about the model in health and wellness because I think that same model, so staffing partnerships with Ann Arbor. And there was a third one you said, the telehealth, focusing on our online experience is gonna be a big one. So there's more work we're doing on our end, our end so that we can reach out and be partners with you too, though I'm sure we already are in some ways, there's just only so much we can all do. But anyway, we'll be in touch. So thank you. Um, just a quick grant comment. So I know some academic units have started hiring grant support within their units. And if that ends up being beneficial and more grants are coming to fruition, then maybe higher leadership can think about having that support in other units that can't afford it right now um, or guidance to help figure out how those units can support having a grant writer um, or not a grant writer, but whatever the grant support is. Um, and then a quick comment about comprehensive studies program. I love the idea. I'm all for it. I think it's amazing. I went to the talk um, a few months ago. Um, or last year. And this is just a comment to think about and not a concern, but just like a pause. Um, I remember at that conversation 
sitting back and thinking about the criteria for Ann Arbor and how they select their students to participate and me thinking, wow, a lot of our U of M Flint students would qualify for this. And so how do you scale that? And in K-12 schools, we use a tiered system and everyone gets tier one and that reaches about 80% of students. And then about 15% need these extra support tier two. Then you have it about 5% at tier three. Um, and when I think about that and the comprehensive studies, I think we, we have, you know, way more than 15% that will be at that tier two. And that's okay, but just how will that be managed and how are we going to scale that to reach everybody? And maybe it's re-looking at the tier one that everybody gets um, and revamping that a bit. And I would say that's that's a challenge that we have in many of our support initiatives is just around scaling them. Um, we we do very well in, in small cohort-based support programs. Our Promise Scholar program was producing outcomes that we hadn't seen in 15 years. But these are high touch, time intensive, very expensive programs to run. So that's why it's important that we find these additional funding resources um, in order to support them. And another example I can provide is um, the way that we were able to scale our success mentorship program was through a partnership with a third party they're called mentor collective that they they have the technology they have the platform um they have the staffing that was the only way that we could really do it and that enabled us to go from about 25 students in our pilot now we can support support up to 500 students but again comes with a cost um so but i think we do have to think creatively about how do we scale these programs that we know are working and then really do some analysis for the programs that aren't working and that's okay, but let's figure out why. And then let's make some decisions. Does it make sense for us to tweak it and move forward or does it make sense for us to invest in something else? And I think that we need to make that part of our process too. Anything online? Okay, it's it's a it's about noon. Thank you guys for coming out. We really appreciate it. Our next one is on Wednesday. Um, Wednesday we'll discuss academic support and career services. Okay, thank you.